to this month's episode of the Tudor Travel Guides A to Z of Tudor Places. I'm Sarah and I'm the Tudor Travel Guide. So today we are focusing on a great medieval palace favoured by the Yorkist kings, once nursery to the royal children of the Tudor dynasty and a popular residence of Henry VIII during the early part of his reign. Yes, today, folks, we are exploring the history of Eltham Palace in Kent. So let's start by understanding a little bit about the origins of the house. Well, originally, Eltham was a simple manor house owned by Odo, the Bishop of Bayeux. He was the Earl of Kent and younger brother of William the Conqueror. We first hear of Odo's manor at Eltham in the Doomsday Book of 1086 and from this point onwards over the next couple of hundred years the estate at Eltham changed hands several times until in 1295 the Bishop of Durham acquired it. Now he seems to have set about rebuilding the manor house and he constructed a defensive perimeter wall of stone and brick within the line of a square moat. But Eltham finally passed into royal hands in 1305 when it was gifted to the future King Edward II and thus began its illustrious royal history. It was visited frequently by successive medieval kings and queens who lavished money upon the estate and had new royal lodgings, service buildings and gardens constructed at Eltham. Its glory day stretched through the 14th and 15th centuries and it was particularly favoured by Edward IV who built the Great Hall which is the jewel in the crown at Eltham today and you can still see Edward's Sun in Splendour emblem which adorns the entrance to the Great Hall. Eltham witnessed much of England's turbulent history during this time and it was treasured by its royal owners as a palace of pleasure nestled amongst some of the finest hunting ground in the country and as successive monarchs enlarged the buildings, so Eltham's importance grew until by the reign of Henry VIII, the Palace of Eltham, as it was by then known, was considered one of the king's five great houses. So that means it could house the entire court of around a thousand people, similar to Greenwich or Hampton Court. Now, during the early years of the Tudor dynasty, Eltham was used first and foremost as a royal nursery. Indeed, the, the young Prince Henry himself was raised at Eltham alongside his sisters, while his elder brother Arthur was being schooled for kingship elsewhere. Of course, famously, Henry received the celebrated humanist Erasmus in the Great Hall at Eltham, precociously asking the scholar to write a poem during his stay. Now, you'll be able to hear more about this event in a podcast that I recorded recently at Eltham and which is now available on Podbean's iTunes and Spotify. And I'll make sure to post a link to the episode in question in the description below. Anyway, continuing on with our story. Well, after Henry's accession to the throne as King Henry VIII, Eltham remained a popular and significant residence. Early on in Henry's reign, the king commissioned new works at the palace, including the building of a new permanent tilt yard to the east of the palace moat, the construction of new privy apartments for himself in the Western Range, whilst also making alterations to the Queen's lodgings. And finally, he commanded the construction of a new brick-built chapel in the central courtyard. That becomes important in the history of Eltham, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now, despite this large investment in the fabric of the building, in fact, its use as a palace was already in decline by this time, for lying just two miles to the west was Greenwich Palace, constructed by Henry VII at the turn of the 16th century. 
Now, when Henry VIII succeeded his father in 1509, Greenwich quickly assumed far greater importance than its medieval royal cousin. And as a consequence, Eltham was increasingly confined to being used as a nursery for royal children or as a place of entertainment for important visitors or simply as a hunting lodge. However, a couple of notable events took place at Eltham during the first half of the King's reign. So, on Christmas Eve, 1515, Cardinal Wolsey took the oath of office as Lord Chancellor at Eltham. And then, in 1525, he drew up the famous Ordinances of Eltham. These were regulations designed to reduce waste in the royal household. These ordinances were ratified at the palace. In the 1530s, so we're fast forwarding a few years, Eltham enjoyed its fair share of drama also, particularly in relation to the story of Anne Boleyn. Now we hear of my lady Anne staying at Eltham alongside the king and court in June, July 1532, when she is recorded to have received sumptuous gifts of fabrics from the king's privy purse. So these included, quote, black satin for a cloak, black velvet for edging of the same cloak, black velvet to line the collar, black satin to line the sleeves, black satin for a nightgown, and black taffeta to line the same gown. And if you want to see what that might have looked like, check out my video on dressing a Tudor lady, when I wear an interpretation of this nightgown and how it may have actually appeared at the beginning of the talk. So anyway, this event occurred just before Anne and Henry's historic trip to Calais, where Anne would be presented as Henry's queen-in-waiting. It seems, in fact, she was being dressed for the occasion. I mean, a girl's got to have the right clothes, right? <laughs> Now, following the trip to Calais, which took place in the early autumn, the couple were back at Eltham on the 24th and 25th of November of the same year. They stayed there on their way back from the aforementioned meeting with Francis I. And the couple must have been jubilant, for the trip was being heralded as a triumphant success. Francis had acknowledged Anne's position as Henry's consort and pledged to support them in their petition to the Pope, urging the Holy Father to have Henry's marriage to Catherine annulled. What is more, most historians agree that at some point during their stay in Calais or on their way back to London, the couple slept with each other for the first time. And one cannot help but imagine that this must have been one of the happiest times in Anne's life. Everything that she had been striving for over the previous six years was finally coming to pass. And the world must have seemed to lie at her feet. After Anne became queen, Eltham was one of the royal palaces to be used as a nursery for the infant princess Elizabeth born on the 7th of September 1533. Thus, the court was there at both Easter 1534 and three months later in July. On both occasions, Anne, who was ever the doting mother, must have been happy to be in the company of the little princess. However, it was during the first of these visits that Anne and the king's elder daughter Mary infamously quarrelled after the two ladies had found themselves hearing mass at the same time in the chapel at Eltham. Now the story goes that Mary curtsied towards Anne before leaving to return to her rooms. Anne didn't see the gesture but it was subsequently reported to her and she interpreted it as a rare show of goodwill and so sent a conciliatory message returning the courtesy, along with a friendly missive that was no doubt meant to be an olive branch of peace. However, when the message was relayed to Mary at dinner, she was reported to have replied rudely. <laughs> the Queen could not have possibly sent it, nor is it fit that she should, nor can it be so sudden, Her Majesty being so far from this place. 
You should have said that Lady Anne Boleyn had sent it, for I can acknowledge no other queen but my mother, nor esteem them her friends who were not hers. As for the reverence that I made, it was made only to her maker and hers alone, and that she had been deceived to think otherwise. Anne was undoubtedly hurt, frustrated and furious. Following on from a similar incident at Hatfield only a few months earlier, the Queen once again threatened to bring down Mary's high spirit. Finally, the King and Court spent Christmas at Eltham in 1535. Once more, Anne must have been both relieved and overjoyed, as by that time she knew she was once again pregnant. However, only five months later, the court and city of London would be scandalised to hear the allegations that Anne had had sex with her brother at Eltham during the festive season. Shocking enough, but even more repulsive given the fact that the Queen was at the time pregnant. So, drama all round. Anyway, after this time, Eltham's importance increasingly went into decline. The king favoured other palaces lying further upstream, such as Whitehall and Hampton Court in particular. And as Henry spent more and more time in these residences, Eltham slipped ever more into obscurity and decay. Now, I wanted to give you a few words about visiting what remains of Eltham Palace now. If you do go along and visit, you may notice that the local street names around the entrance to Eltham whisper to you of its ancient past. Names such as Courtyard and Tiltyard Approach. Now, the former alludes to the fact that the area lying outside of the moat, directly in front of the main gates, was once occupied by a huge outer courtyard called the Green Court, which was flanked on the north, east and west sides by service buildings servicing the palace. The second name refers to the aforementioned tilt yard, which lay to the east of Green Court. Now, the North Stone Bridge, which you will cross over to reach the palace, was originally built by Richard II in 1396. It's enchanting and it conveys a sense of grandeur of the palace that once existed. Its four stone arches span one of the widest moats in England, reaching nearly a hundred feet across on its south side. Now today many people come to Elton to visit one of the finest Art Deco houses in the country and these buildings sit roughly on top was, of what was once a vast range of courtier lodgings running around the northeast edge of the original Great Court. However, the medieval Great Hall, which as I mentioned was built by Edward IV, does survive in a greatly restored state. Whilst not quite as grand, it is certainly reminiscent of the Great Hall at Hampton Court Palace. Many a king and queen has feasted in that hall, and you might imagine if you visit Erasmus arriving to be greeted by the young and precocious Prince Henry in 1499. Now, out on the lawn in front of the Great Hall, you will find exposed the remains of the West Range, which once contained the King and Queen's Privy Apartments. The Queen's Privy Apartments to the north, which is at the end of the range closest to where you enter the turning circle from the main entrance, and the King's to the south. And as you stand there looking westwards, you will notice that the palace stood proudly atop some of the highest ground in the neighbourhood. And views from the royal apartments must have been magnificent, looking down across a broad and beautiful landscape that stretched out to the west. Now, two miles away, in the distance, you would have seen the wooded outline of Greenwich Park. Whilst further in the distance, it was possible to trace out the spire of the Gothic Cathedral of St Paul's and the lofty roof of Westminster Abbey. 
I think Elton Palace has an easy charm and somehow even though London stands silhouetted against the horizon just a couple of miles away it is easy to feel that you are tucked away in a peaceful idyll that somehow despite the neglect and abandonment by its former royal patrons still speaks easily of happier times at the centre of English sovereign power. So now on to my Tudor Rose rating for Elton Palace which I rate on four different criteria. The first, historical significance. Well, I'd give Elton five Tudor Roses. I mean, whoa, <laughs> this place, a royal palace inhabited by medieval and Tudor monarchs over some 300 years. I mean, need I say more? Definitely deserves a five. For the wow factor, well, the Great Hall deserves at least a four out of five. It is one of the larger Great Halls in the country still surviving. And I think probably only Westminster Hall and Hampton Court Palace can steal the limelight, in my opinion. Now, its authenticity, well, Elton's a tale of two buildings, a little like Hampton Court. Much of the original Tudor Palace has gone and is replaced by the Courtauld's glamorous 1930s party house. And the Great Hall was used as a barn after the palace's demise, so had to be rescued and restored. Yet, an excellent job was done, and so, all in all, given that, I give Ultimate 3.5 Tudor Roses. The final one is accessibility. Now I should say that the palace is managed by English Heritage and opening is seasonal, so make sure you check out their website if you want to visit. However, if you do go, the principal buildings of interest are on the ground floor, so easily accessible to people with limited nobility. So on both those counts fused together, I think its accessibility is good. I'd give it four or five Tudor Roses. So for more information about Elton Palace, do visit the English Heritage website, which is www.english-heritage.org.uk. And finally, just to say that Elton Palace is just one property of around 70 included in my co-authored In the Footsteps of Anne Boleyn book, which I wrote with Natalie Gruniger, and which takes you on a journey of Anne's life through the places she visited and called home, stretching from cradle to grave. And I will put a link so that you can purchase this book, should you wish, in the description below as ever. So with that, I'd like to thank you for joining me on this month's A to Z of Tudor Places and I look forward to talking to you next month about our next Tudor location, which will begin with the letter F. So that's all for now from me, Sarah, the Tudor Travel Guide, and I look forward to seeing you on our next Tudor road trip. Happy time travelling! Mm -hmm.